So thank you. Uh, sorry, uh, it was a, a little technical mistake. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I have to say, I was looking forward to meeting you all in person. So that is a, a small compromise, uh, better than nothing. And uh, it is uh, before I begin. That's a theme that I, as I submitted it two years ago, uh, it was something an elaboration in my paper that have uh, somehow begun to develop. Um, after a conference in Venice on the fifth, uh, 100, 500 years of the foundation of the Ghetto in Venice. And then in the meantime, have been developing this. So this is just a, a sketch of a larger um, investigation on the notion of Eruv, or Eruv uh, on the problems and the connect theological connection to the um, this notion. As we will see. So uh, many of the things I'm going to say are just really compressed to be, since I have no more than 20 minutes, uh, compressed in, in what I'm trying to say. And that for, for the publication and for the discussion, I will surely elaborate on this uh, much more. So uh, thank you. So that I, then I shall begin. So um, the Eruv of Venice from fragmentation to unification. Um, uh, my uh, starting point is uh, not just the definition of what a ghetto is and how the ghetto of Venice has been established in time, uh, since I believe there is enough uh, scholarship about this. There are many very interesting books that have been also published quite recently on, on how it happened that the Venice ghetto became from a small quarter to be enlarged in time and then to be propagated in all, uh, all over the world as a notion, a concept that we now use as ghetto. And uh, there's also no need to elaborate too much on the representation of that, because there are, as I will mention, especially in the paper, there have been established many um, uh, projects, especially in, in Italy, I believe, in representing the ghetto in three dimensions and try to approach so uh, allow for a um, concrete um, um, appreciation of what the ghetto was and a representation architectural representation of that um, for the short time I have to my disposal I will especially focus on the theolog theological implications which are connected on a specific evaluation of space, not just time, but space and time in Judaism. Um, since one of the problems I will uh, try to approach uh, is the question of Shabbat. As we all know, it's the holy day of the week uh, uh, in which almost nothing is permitted but to spend your own time with your family, studying if you want, if you wish, uh, having sexual interrelation uh, relationships if you want as well, but especially not to move too much away from your domain. And that's as a typical and notorious problem, especially among the anti-Semites. How shall we define the, this notion of Shabbat? Um, the, what intrigues me in the call for papers that's been published, and I was honored to be invited to, is that there is special interaction with the notion of Shabbat as a limitation in both time and space, which is the Eruv, which is, as we will see, um, a specific, a specific uh, dispositive, legal dispositive, to allow for certain activity, activities that should be normally be forbidden. Um, by the way, as I'm expanding this project also to the very same experience in the ghetto of Ferrara, so my city in Italy. Um, there were usually many suspects about uh, and suspicions about what it is to extend the perimeter of Shabbat to all the city, for instance. And many anti Semites says, You see, these Jews are even are able to follow their own rules. That's to say that the a very um, abstract notion like the one of the roof has actually very important social and theological implications or ramifications because it implies uh, negotiation between the Jewish space and the non-Jewish space. 
uh, in time, in a specific time, which is the time of Shabbat. So my paper is um, divided in four very short um, chapters. One is about the movement restriction of Shabbat. The second is a very short interpretation of the Zohar on this very limitation. And then something which expands more on the idea and notion of topography, which is a political theology of Eruv, uh, based both on Kabbalistic and uh, um, contemporary sources. And then a reading of the notion of ghetto, what happens to ghetto as a topographically enclosed space when it is open up to um, the notion of Eruv. And I will elaborate on um, very nice uh, representation of the Yerov from uh, a Jewish artist and rabbi who is based in, in America and who was kind enough to give me, send me his uh, pictures, his arti artistic pictures. For the time being, I would just focus especially strictly on a very specific segment of his production and in this case for the um, ghetto of Venice. So, uh, as all we know, should know, uh, Shabbat as a very special portion of time uh, within the uh, Jewish week um, is a special day. Um, among the many things that this uh, day brings with it, so I won't even attempt to elaborate on the theology of Shabbat here now for obvious reasons. One of the most striking things is, of course, what is written in Exodus 16, 29, which says, uh, normally Jewish people shall not move uh, too far away from their, um, their, their homes. Um, the text says, see, the Lord has uh, given you the Shabbat. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place, let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. And he said, Ishmin Komo. The most important thing is from his own place. Um, one of the problems, of course, is that if we, as always, we, we interpret literally this um, prohibition. Then I want to say that if I find myself on Shabbat sitting on this very chair, I should move from my Bimen Kome, which should be from this very place. So the question is, how literally shall I understand this uh, interpretation of, uh, of place? Um, which is a, a theological question, of course, because it implies um, that uh, um, it cannot be literal, because it, if it is literal, it means nobody will actually move from his own place. But it cannot just be symbolic, because otherwise you would be uh, it would be transgressing like that. Um, so one of the point here um, is that. Uh, uh, the rabbis have um, elaborated on this and come to the, briefly, to the conclusion that you shall not move from your quarter, so from your, from your home, which includes a, la, a certain number of spaces. Especially, the, uh, from a legal point of view, there is a strong um, then distinction between a private domain, which is called Reshut uh, Yachid, and what everything which is not that, um, so it is a uh, reshuta rabim, so the public domain. I use private and public domain, which is a loose uh, uh, translation of the notion. But the, the idea is that there is a dimension of reshuta, so in which I have legal power and uh, and uh, uh, mobility, which should confine myself into this very specific position and something for the others, for um, the many others, which to me are kind of non-private space, uh, which we could call public domain, as 
others' private domains, if you wish, but not my own private domain. The notion of Eruv, which has a dedicated tractate on this, so I won't even try to elaborate on its intricacies and very difficult legislation. And of course, on the many commentaries has been written in this tractate since it's an actual uh, practice even today. Um, I just very, if you allow me, uh, the definition from the Oxford Dictionary that says, what is that? What is an eruv? Which means from, from, the verb, from the verb arav to mix up together. You mix up spaces. So is that an urban area enclosed by a wild boundary which is symbolically extends the private domain, so the Yeshuda Yachid, Yachid, of Jewish how, households into public areas, permitting activities within it that are normally forbidden in public on the Shabbat. So it's a long expression to say it is a way of merging places altogether to allow certain things. Um, Typographically speaking, uh, sorry, topographically speaking, that means somehow that if we join together two public private domains, like the two different Rashuta Yahid, then we have a common Rashuta Yahid that somehow cancels or un, uh, quits the existence of the other domains. You enclose two spaces into the same. So somehow, they do exist, the public domain still exists in the sense that it's physically out there, but uh, with uh, spe specific rituals, there is a connection, uh, a connection established between these private different domains and becomes formally, at least for the being of the Shabbat, a single whole space. It allows, for instance, since it's uh, like having a huge house to move in within these perimeters and uh, carry something uh, physically outside from your household, but actually not outside of the new legal perimeter of your household, which is might be even the city itself. So in other words, I can visit my neighbors and bring uh, my uh, Shabbos uh, uh, meal over there, as I invited, I, as a courtesy, I can bring some food together and I'm not transgressing the Shabbat because I'm just, bring you over there as just I was bringing this food from my room to another room within my house. My house. So this is a very loose and short description of what an Eruv is. The question is, how shall the, uh, how does the Kabbalah understand this? Uh, from Zohar to 64, especially on this side, on uh, this uh, prohibition, he says, let no one go out on his place. For this and precious and holy and outside from it, there is all there are other gods. Dikdusha, uh, okay, is the most important thing. The implication is that where you live is your where you can sanctify yourself. By implication, what is outside, okay, Levar in Aramaic, it is a place where Elohim are, which means polytheists. So it is something like to say a place in which you don't meet your own fellows, Jewish fellows, but other ones. For that reason, you shall remain or uh, dwell or the Shachem in your own place, where the verb to, to dwell and to, to live, of course, has implications with the notion of Shrina, the act of living within the presence of God. So that implies that there is a juxtaposition between private domain and public domain or Rashuta Yahid or Rashuta Rabim in your own place. Well, of course, I don't need to say that place, Makom is also a name of God. You shall find the Lord. You live in a Jewish quarter. Now, regardless of if it is a ghetto or just a Yudengas or whatever, or just a a neighborhood, you meet Jews and you live in sanctity. On the other hand, almost literally on the other hand, you have other gods, you have a city, you have Gentiles, and then you have impurity. Well, of course, here the juxtaposition between sanctity and purity shall be regarded at least in a ritual sense, like a difference in 
in nature, an ontological difference, that doesn't necessarily imply a difference in morality. So it's not that the people out there are uh, evil, you're just not as clean, ritually clean as a Jew should be. If we represent that typographically, we have a small center, which is the Kedusha or the point of sanctity or the name, um, uh, in, in the, the holy name, the Yud Hei Vav Hei name. And then you have uh, an extending space, uh, expanding or disseminating outside based on the temple of Jerusalem. And on the outside you find, you shall find impurity. Having said that, then we can go back to the notion of Eruv. And the notion of Eruv is, what does it happen actually? I, I mean, we know that literally, what happens is that I can move my things, I can uh, go somewhere without transgressing the Shabbat's boundary because I have merged legally, have merged many spaces altogether. But the question is, if I have assumed that my place, it's a place of sanctity, what is the implication? What does it mean to extend this sanctity over a place that should be impure? So, if we read, interestingly enough, not the Zohar, but the Kmenea Zohar, so a later text, that uh, was, um, by, by the way, one of the first ones published in Venice, um, 30 years, 40 years after the, the, the establishment of the, of the ghetto, we have um, elaboration in the notion of uh, carrying out on Shabbat, uh, what, is, is it, what it is not to bring out things on Shabbat. And by a, a quotation from uh, the Mishnah, carry on on Shabbat includes two acts. They speak about it and they say this is steering and moving away. Since the tree is moved to another house, whoever uproots an object from its place and moves outside from its domain to another domain is as if he uprooted the tree of life, which is a sign of the pact, and moved it to a foreign domain uh, and moved it to another domain that is bitter and spleen that causes Israel to be uprooted from the land of Israel and to be exiled in a foreign land that is a public domain. So if we read it in Aramaic Hebrew, we understand that they are implying not only that the place in which you are, it's a uh, place of sanctity. But when you go outside, if you transgress the, the, the Shabbat, or you bring something outside the Shabbat, you are entering a foreign domain. Foreign means not Jewish, it means actually uh, begalot, exile. So you exile yourself. The implication then is that the private domain is the place in which you find the Lord, and the public domain in which you find other gods, which is exile. So if the Eruv is merging all, all these things together, the question is what happens to the foreignness from the outside. And then we come to the last point, to the ghetto, to Venice, which is now representing this uh, 17th century picture as a map that was free of charge on Wikipedia where I live. We have Ghetto Novo, so this little island that then has been extended in time over to uh, Ghetto Vecchio and then Ghetto Novissimo, as we know. So this is more or less the perimeter of the city, which is located over there in Venice, just a little rod dot. And if we extend over it, sorry, the map of um, uh, sanctity that we had seen before. We see that actually the implication is that there is a small dot of sanctity in the whole city of Venice, and all the rest it is not. All the rest is in, impure. And impure also means, if we use some gender status notions, 
uh, and we compare it to a population of a female population, if uh, the female Jewish city is uh, tehora, so is saint, is clean, by implication, the other one is impure. And it's not a chance, it is really, really very, very telling that a pop popular etymology of the term ghetto, which comes from foundry, is just because they, they melted uh, stuff in this small island, they used to melt stuff in this small island, is homographic to the word ghetto, so his own pillow of divorce. And the popular etymology of ghetto, then it is divorcing from what? From the Gentiles, divorcing from what is impure, also sexually impure, which lies outside. So in this sense, again, a first self-conservative and self-referential notion of ghetto and almost finished is to say, as long as you stay in your own place, okay, bin komo, so since the ish, the, the Jewish male stays in his own place, bin komo, he won't mingle with what is impure from the outside. He won't, he will, he won't live as if he were in Galut, in exile. He will stay in his own little Israel, so to say, like little Italy, his, his own little quarter, which is a representation and a topographical projection of his political theological aspiration. But the complication here is here, haven't we said that we have Iruv? Uh, the point, actually, the very important point here is that uh, Iruv was used and complemented in, in, uh, in many Italian cities, um, just in Venice, but now just is my ongoing project. Also in many northern Italy, uh, northern cities, uh, sorry, cities from northern Italy, like uh, Modena, Ferrara, Reggio Emilia, and Padua as well, and was especially in the in 16th, uh, 18th century, it was um, strongly encouraged by mystics and sometimes sometimes from Sabbat Sabbatians. It was encouraged because when you establish a roof. Of course, you have the commodity, you can move, you have the luxury to be able to move, to go around, to just to not to stay at your place, and then you can even carry your baby. You're not transgressing anything. But these practical matters actually point to something which is extremely more sophisticated, which with this notion we'll also finish, with this very nice representation of Bene Shachta, that if you merge in this case, Venice, if you merge all the city into Ayruv, so you make all the city a connection within all the space that's possible, and you uh, uh, make it, you, ju you, you don't just allow people to move all around Venice, that's the actual Ayruv of Venice, you don't just uh, move all around Venice, you establish a new topographical dimension in which there is no ghetto anymore because the ghetto has been dispersed or, or melted, if you want to allow me to make a little pun, is melted into the whole dimension of the city. And this means that actually there is no Jewish place or juxtaposed to a Gentile or non Jewish place. Everything has been, if the expression by wasn't so bad, everything has been Jewified, in the sense that everything has been brought back to a uh, uh, theological and topographical and spatial unity. And that's the reason why, and I'm finished with that, because I want it really to be very strict to the 20 minutes, and that's the reason why the Erov was much more than just a practical thing about moving things on Shabbat, or, or, or be able to transgress little uh, uh, prohibitions for the Shabbos, but on the contrary, it was the expectation, the, the, the effort or the attempt to establish a new theological uh, place in space and time that would allow um, 
for a unification of human uh, of all the human beings. So that was the deepest um, notion of the ghetto of um, Venice, of which, as I said, Ben Schacht has been a wonderful representation that shows actually how there is no ghetto anymore, but everything is a single uh, and unique reality. Thank you.